Good morning. morning. Can't believe so many of you are back. <laughs> uh, I, I, that's my way of joking, by the way. It's rude, but it's about the best I've got, so I just have to work with it. Uh, no, I really appreciate you guys. I, I can sense, uh, sense the hunger that's in all of our hearts. That's a beautiful thing to me. I, I know it is to you. And, um, we are people um, and are meant to be people with God's purpose. And uh, God is making that more and more clear to us in these times that uh, we're not here uh, just because we were born. We were divinely purposed to live in this time. In the time that will be unprecedented darkness, the Lord will arise with unprecedented light Amen. in a people. That's what Isaiah 60 prophesies about. The glory of the Lord will rise on us. And nations shall come to the brightness of its shining. So isn't that uh, awesome? That's a scriptural prophecy concerning what the Lord is going to do, has done in the past, and will do again. <clears throat> We've seen cycles in this, honestly. Uh, uh, that's true because the enemy is constantly doing what he does, and the Lord is constantly doing what he does. Now, and I want to be clear about this. The Lord actually moves first, and the enemy responds to him. It's not the other way around. <clears throat> the enemy is moving the way he's moving now because he sees what I want to be able to see more clearly, what the Lord is beginning to do. And so Satan is responding to that. So God's the great initiator. He is the aggressor. I'm afraid the church has lost some of that fire. And we've become only on, on a defensive plane and not understanding the aggressive nature of the Godhead. Amen? It's a military thing. And I grew up most of my life um, studying the military, preparing to go into the military, that was my one aim. Uh, from the time I could read, I was reading military history, military books. I have a photographic memory concerning military hardware, battles. The Lord gave it to me. Don't usually say this, but I'm going to tell you. I had every aim at 18 years of age to go into a lifetime of military service right before the Lord got a hold of me <laughs> and redirected me. Not that I think there's anything wrong with military. Some of us are called to go into it. But he wouldn't let me. And uh, most of my life has been spent uh, doing what I do now and understanding um, the spiritual understanding of what it is to fight. And what, what is needed in this hour is warriors. God is looking for warriors. How many can feel that? And, and listen, there's not a person that the Lord is in, if he's in you, there's not a person that the Lord is in that you're not meant to be a warrior. It may not be the same function as your neighbor, but nevertheless, forget the differing functions for just a second and understand that the aggressive God nature that is now in us in Christ by the Holy Spirit is meant to bring forth, actually pick a fight in our time. Don't you think, that's what the Lord tells me about it. He said, for too long these powers in the heavenlies have had, had their way with my body. That's gone on far too long. Wouldn't you agree? Some of us have suffered the consequences of that and, and uh, enough is enough. And it's not just because we can say enough is enough. It's something more than that. It's the Lord is moving. The Lord is moving. And uh, I, find as in, I find in these conferences, I'm just going to level with you, witches come into them, Satanists come into them regularly. And they're welcome as long as they want to stir up trouble. Because if they want trouble, they'll find it. That's not a threat. That's a promise. The Lord is in a fight mode. And I'm aware of it. And I'm not blind. I can see. I can see witches. I can see the Satanists. So um, I had a confrontation with one four days ago from here who astro projected into my home. That's a regular occurrence, by the way. So uh, 
Why did I tell you that? Because, listen, folks, we've been blind too long. They've infiltrated the church. And if they're going to be that bold, I'm going to be this bold. You want to fight? Okay. (laughs) You're not going to like the results. But, so, you say, man, that's too bold, Terry. Well, forgive me, but I'm not going to ask for God for forgiveness because I'm telling you he's ready for a fight. And I, I'm just, for me, it's not a game. It happens regularly, and I get a kick out of it, honestly, because I watch the power of the Lord <laughs> do what he does. And, and uh, resistance for them is futile. That's just how powerful the Lord is. I'm not making this frivolous. I'm just telling you, the Lord is awesome. And he loves them, and he wants to give them, the witches and the Satanists, a chance to repent. And I said this in our December conference with uh, Paul Keith Davis and Rick Joyner. I welcomed them into the, into the meeting. They are welcome, as long as they don't cause trouble. But if they're there, there to really hear and repent, they're welcome. But if they're there to stir up problems, and like what was going on last night, uh, under their breath, pray against me, you're going to find a fight. And it's not going to be pretty. So, I might be born at night, but it wasn't last night. All right, well, enough of that. Say, man, I've never heard anything said like that. Stick around. This is just not a game, and we're not in a time of games. Something has changed in the spirit. I I hope we're aware of it. I'm trying to be more and more aware of it. What went on yesterday is not meant to go on today. Where the witches and the Satanists could hide in the congregations of God yesterday, they're not meant to hide today. So, again, that's just one aspect. There's so many things that are changing that need to change. You guys understand uh, where I'm coming from. Need God's transformation. We need it desperately. And he wants to grant us that in his son. True transformation, internal transformation. So uh, anyway, I want, before I get started, I got to say something to the four musketeers over here. <laughs> I mean that in a good way. I really do. You know, the musketeers were the king's men. That's who they were. They were committed to the kingdom and to the king. And they had this little motto. Here's the way I say it. It's the way the Lord told me to say it. It's, it was all for the one and the one for the all. That was their motto. So anyway, I want to say something to you guys about uh, being the warriors that you are. Because you're more than just up here so-called leading in worship. That's going on. But you're warriors, and uh, you create more than an atmosphere. What's going on in the spirit, if I can just say this, I mean to encourage you guys with this, is a restraint and a keeping at bay the enemy and a releasing by releasing the Lord in presence and power, and it's beautiful to see. Just want to say that to you guys, to encourage you. Um, that's, that's not always true and what we're calling praise and worship in this day. And so uh, it takes a warrior to know a warrior. And I appreciate who you guys are in the spirit. I really do. So I hope that encourages you guys. And you guys know this, but you have swords and you're utilizing them. And uh, some of you are praying, particularly a couple of you have really been praying about this thing of seeing more. And the Lord told me to tell you guys, you are going to see more clearly, particularly the purpose of God the great eternal purpose. So I just want to pass that on to you guys. You really are going to have eyes that see clearly. So, and that may be for all four of you, but at least uh, two of you have been praying that prayer specifically. So, all right. So let's, let's look at um, uh, the scriptures again. We're going to look at Acts 13. But before we do that, um, I just want us to, again, go before the Lord. Just right where you're seated. You don't need to stand up. Just right where you're seated for just a moment. As I was before the Lord this morning, the Lord was just stirring me with some prayers and uh, my heart was burning with the prayers of God. That's what he does, I'm sure he does it to you as he releases his desire in prayer. My heart was just aflame 
by what I was hearing and what he was saying. And so uh, I just want to pray over myself, over all of us, some of what the Lord was saying to me this morning. That uh, part of it is repentance, actually. So I just want to say that. I, Lord, we repent before you this morning for everything, Lord, that's been allowed in our vision that has not been your vision. And we ask this morning to be filled on a perpetual basis with the eternal vision of the Godhead, why he created humanity, why we exist. Take it, Holy Spirit, to the depths. Reconstitute us according to your plan. Give us as a people a new constitution, the Holy One, the eternal plan of God. That means, Holy Spirit, that you will be faithful to open our eyes and to grant us living understanding. We welcome that work, Holy Spirit. We come out to you to come on to holy ground, heavenly ground. We thank you, Lord. You're faithful to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think or imagine. Steady our hearts. If you want to, just put your hand on your heart. Steady our hearts in this time. When everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that what remains is the unshakable kingdom that is firstly within. Steady our hearts. Subjugate our souls, our flesh. Give to us, Spirit of the Lord, the mind of Christ. Bless you, Lord. We welcome your presence even stronger. I ask for the increasing of the presence of the Lord, your presence, Holy Spirit among us. You are so welcome among us. Your presence, Holy Spirit, your absolute dominion. Welcome the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. And as the scripture says, will be the treasure. We welcome you whose name is Jealous 
to have all of us and take possession of us, complete possession, that we would be a possessed people by the Spirit of the Lord. Crush all resistance within me, within us. We pray the prayer of submission to you, Lord, not our will, yours be done. In me, in us, among us, through us. It's going to pray this. I welcome the angels of the Lord that are assigned to us individually and congregationally. We welcome. No more restraint to be upon you. We take responsibility before the Lord of his intent and purpose among us that should free you to be fully active and activated on the Father's behalf in this city. The Father's will, the Father's purpose in the ministry again. And no other. Thank you, Lord. We have the shofar blower here. Where's the, there, there you go. Yes, brother. Could you blow it three times? That'd be okay. I want you to stand. to make this declaration. Let the name of the Lord be glorified in and among us. Make us to be a people of the name. Write your name upon our forehead. Write the name of your Father upon our forehead. Write the name of the heavenly city upon our forehead. That means the bride. That's what the heavenly city is. One more time, brother. We welcome divine assistance. We welcome the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We welcome the inward fire of God. We welcome the releasing of the angels of God. We fight. We stand. We, stand. We, resist. we resist. We wrestle. We wrestle. You, gain you gain the victory. Well, you can be seated, I think. You guys know there'll be times when we won't be able to leave. The Lord's made that very clear to me back last year, and 
we're all going to find ourselves on our faces before the Lord, and we'll just be there till the Lord's done, whenever that is. You know, I don't, I don't want to try to make something happen. The Lord has to do it. But I'm just announcing ahead of time that fact of what's going to happen. There's going to be simply times when the presence of the Lord is so among us. Nobody's going to want to leave. We've already been experiencing some of that, but no one's going to want to leave. If you have to leave, you can, but most of us are going to find ourselves just on our faces before the Lord, however long. We welcome those days again when the Lord's orchestrating it, not human orchestration. That's never sustainable. The good ideas of man won't ever carry this thing through. It's going to demand the Holy Spirit orchestrating us. He's the only one who knows what he's doing. <laughs> Are you finding that out? I'm finding that out more and more. I, most of my encounters with the Lord, I, my, it's real simple. Most of them are like this. I am a child and you are the ancient of days. That's just very real to me. I don't know what I don't know. But when I behold him, all I can do is weep. I weep for the present state of things. I weep for his testimony that's fallen. I weep for our lack of his glory, his presence, his life. You know, I've never been so rejoicing in my entire life and so broken simultaneously. It's a weird dynamic. It's what Paul wrote about in Corinthians. Rejoicing, sorrowful yet rejoicing. That's what he said about it. Anyway, Acts 13, we'll look there firstly. I began last night, and, and I'm doing this purposefully. I just want to mention this. Uh, focus primarily upon uh, vision and the prophets, um, vision and the church. Not so much talking about the eternal purpose as of yet, more talking about the need for vision of the eternal purpose. We have not moved yet. I, I plan to move there tonight. And I want to encourage you guys, you can go on my website if you want to hear more about the eternal purpose. You can go on my website and access uh, where I've shared more about this freely. It's no charge. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't bring it up. But I've spent an entire series of messages talking about the eternal purpose. I'm going to barely touch it while I'm here. That's why I bring this up. So if uh, you want to hear more about it, feel free to go on the website. It's Terry Bennett Ministries. You can go on the website and access, uh, listen to all you want to listen. So again, it's free. So uh, that's not a promotion. That's just to try to help us. I have a lot of questions. and na Naturally, a lot of people, we all have questions. I have questions. And some of those uh, possibly can be answered just by listening to other uh, messages that I've shared. I'm always aware, I'm sure you guys are, I'm always aware that in a, any given time frame, there's only so much time, and that's true, Leonard, to say so much. And, and obviously, we're not going to be able to get to everything. There's going to be vast things that are left uncovered. We're still learning, I am. Things are still being revealed. I've been identifying five, six things dealing with the eternal purpose. I'll barely touch those tonight. But uh, <clears throat> I've spoken in more detail about them in other messages. So uh, this morning, we're, we're going to try to hit once again this issue of vision. Again, understanding this, the reason it's important that we have his vision is why Proverbs 29 was written. Without vision, God's vision, people are going to perish. And um, there's a time in my life I didn't understand God's meaning in Proverbs 29 with that statement. But the more, uh, I'm just saying this, but the more I'm before the throne and the more I hear and the more I see of him and the more I behold him 
And the more that's released from him of living understanding and eternal purpose, the more I've come to realize these statements were never random. They were never about lesser things. God was always by his spirit. Of course this is true. It's the work of the Holy Spirit who inspired these scriptures, pushing us, directing us, pressing us on towards the heavenly, towards the eternal. The eternal that's meant to be made known now, not just some future time. It begins now. The life of Christ in us is a now life, is it not? It's a resurrection life. That means this, that it's the life that has conquered death that's in us. I want you to think of the significance of that statement. That means this, that the darkness has no place. That's why the Old Testament scriptures, if they touched a dead corpse, they had to be removed from the people. Death has no place among God's people. I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about the things of death. Darkness, evil, wickedness, sin. The Holy Spirit was weaving that into the, what we call the Old Testament scriptures, showing that if you touched a dead body, you couldn't come into the house of the Lord, even the priests, especially the priests. They couldn't come into the tabernacle, couldn't come into the temple. They had to go through purification. They'd be out for seven days. What's God saying to us in that? There's no death. This is the resurrection life that Christ is, the life that's in us. And believe you me, it doesn't produce evil. Amen. It's a life that has conquered death. And that's a progression. I understand that as you understand that. But let's be sure about this. It's a progression unto greater and greater fullness of him not being full of ourselves. Anyway, that's not the message, but it's a good message. (laughs) It's the truth. This life in us that is Christ, the life of Christ, is beautiful life, overcoming life, victorious life. It's not just the winning of a victory. It's a life that makes us even more than conquerors. That's more than winning a victory. That's a life that, that is able to conquer all situations, every battle. Amen? I want to be clear. The warriors that are coming forth, it's important that they see. We're talking about vision. It's important that they see. The beginning, let's say it this way, the making of every warrior begins in the presence of the Lord. It begins by beholding him, not the enemy. You know that, don't you? The greatest warfare that can be released is among those who have seen the king in his beauty, in his glory, in his majesty, and have been undone. And I say this to the warriors back home. We have a warriors meeting back home. It's not open to the public. It can't be. Be too many dead bodies. I'm not kidding you. Because in that meeting, it is owned. We've had to guard that meeting to keep people from coming into it who are not ready. Most people, you can't have people coming in who need deliverance from demons into a meeting where you're taking on. And we don't go looking for them. They come to us. Anyway, that's way too much information probably. And it's not enough. It's way too much, but not enough. So try to forget I just said that. No, don't, don't do that. No, no, no. Here's my point in that. See, I've had to, in talking to the warriors, had to make certain we understand this. Never forget this. You must maintain that place of being before the Lord for the Lord. Completely focused upon Him. Completely worshiping, gazing, being transformed into His likeness and in His image. That's how warriors are made. What we're bringing to the table is not our own strength. What we're bringing to the table in this fight is the presence of the Almighty. We are, because of He who is in us, allowing Him to fight through us as vessels. He is extraordinarily effective in this, if we'll let Him be. To the pulling down of strongholds, 
to pulling down of every antagonistic thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Anyway, so, so listen, why am I saying that to you? Because the Lord wants a group here of warriors in this valley who will bring it onto a high heavenly ground. And what I mean by that, I mean this, that our focus is not upon ourselves, but upon the throne. And the very prayers from the throne is what we're repeating right back to him. Don't get it down to the earthly ground. That's not sustainable in a prayer meeting. I'm not saying that Sister Susie's toe aching isn't important to God. I'm saying it's secondary. You get down on that level and it's not sustainable. It'll fall apart quickly. You make it about human need and it'll fall apart. apart. You get it onto heavenly ground and what God is desiring to have and eternally has been so and you can fight on that ground. I hope that helps you. I'm going to say it strongly. The Lord is intensely after prayer, intercession, warriors in this valley. He knows what we must know. That unless Hannah comes forth, there will be no Samuel, there will be no David, and there will be no Solomon. Hannah has got to come forth. All right. I usually preach old messages on that. I love Hannah. She's one of my favorite characters of the scriptures. Her and Rachel. They moved in the same ways in the spirit. So she's one of my heroes. I hope I can grow up and be just like her. (laughs) I'm not kidding you. Powerful woman of God who's got her place near the throne of God now. But the church hasn't realized that yet. Her entire call in ministry was to be before the Lord and to give him what he wanted, a man child. Her womb was shut by God to anything other than the will of God. I would to God that that was true of the church. That our womb was shut to anything other than the perfect will of God. God lay our hand, his hands on us in this. Wouldn't you agree? Could we not agree with that for just a second? God put his hand on us. To the womb of the church is shut to anything other than the perfect, eternal will of God. What the Lord told Hannah, you are never going to birth. That's what he said to her. You are never going to birth any child. You're not meant to. Until you align your heart with me. I'm going to birth through you my perfect will and my answer to the situation that is going on among my people. Are you with me, Hannah? And she was. God, give us that. From her would come God's solution to Israel, Samuel, and a whole new priesthood. And because Samuel would come forth, so would David. And the unprecedented would come in with David. Followed by what was called the golden years of the kingdom. Pictured in Solomon. The fullness of the kingdom. That's what the Holy Spirit put the books of 1 and 2 Samuel in the Bible for us to see it. How do we get to fullness? Hannah. Understand? What's the way to fullness? Hannah. There is no other way. There never has been. Makes me want to weep too. Because it's the small things that matter. It's what's thought to be the insignificant by the church. Surely God can do something through this woman. Check your Bibles and see how many times it was women who saved their husbands. Isn't that true? It was the wife of Isaac who saved Isaac from anointing the wrong son. We know that, don't we? He wanted to anoint Esau, the godless one. What was he thinking? 
All right, well, forget I said all that. But the women should have already been on their feet clapping. I mean, I'm not telling you. God is no respecter of persons. He has no desire to express men's masculinity. And he has no desire to express women's femininity. He's looking for a vessel that he can express himself through. <laughs> we have, we've learned that, haven't we? Men and women. A corporate vessel is really what he's after, not just individual. He'll begin with the individual, but he'll move it corporately. And we really need to understand that, folks. Yes, he's going to lay his hands on some of us individually, but his heart is a corporate vessel. So we can't run and hide and just be doing our own thing. We're going to have to come together. And that's what I want to say to us. What would happen in this valley? This must happen. It must. What would have happened in this valley if we dropped all our differences for just a second and got a view of the heavenly? I want to say this. If I don't get to this part, I want to say this. This vision of the heavenly is a unifying vision. It brings us onto eternal ground and gets us out of this petty earthiness that is keeping us apart. It is a unifying thing because of its focus. When you start wanting what God wants, people will rally to that and others will run away. But the ones that rally, you'll be able in time to trust them. They will become the approved of God. That's worth fighting for. I tell you, as a valley, fight for that. God would do it among you. He made that very plain to me before I came, what he was after in this. His beginning is going to be small, seemingly, but it's going to be the few, the handful, scattered throughout the valley that are rebuilding the altar to God. The greatest mistake we could make is to try to make us all one big congregation. That'd be a terrible mistake. But we do need to be one in spirit. I hope that's encouraging to you. I'm actually giving you the word of the Lord without saying thus saith the Lord. I don't need to say thus saith the Lord. You judge whether it's the Lord or not. But I'm telling you this. If you say yes to him, it'll start popping up throughout the valley. Small groups of men and women on their faces before God. And you'll find the Lord will cause you to find one another. Wouldn't that be beautiful? All right, so we're going to get to Acts 13, believe it or not. We're going to get there. All right, Acts 13, <laughs> verse 27. Just a simple passage, <clears throat> but I think has something that needs to be mined for, mo for a moment, few moments at least. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. This little phrase here, recognizing neither him, speaking of the Lord, nor the utterances of the prophets. They condemned him. I spoke a little bit about this last night, the issue of the wise master builder. In part, when we look at vision, as pertains to the wise master builder, and God is the wise master builder. So thus, he is going to birth in our time the ministry of the wise master builder. I'm just going to declare that to you. The wise master builders are going to come. They're going to come. It's as sure as the sun is going to rise tomorrow. It's that certain. The wise master builders is the apostolic ministry. The apostolic ministry is not reckoned by power gifts. Neither is the true prophetic ministry. Though power gifts are involved, but that's not how it's recognized. 
this may sound critical, but in the 40s and the 50s, when there's such a release of power gifts, where did it take us? Just want to ask you that question. Did it take us or lead us to the apostolic? No. It led us to vessels being honored and lifted up and destroyed. Power gifts are not going to get us there. We're not meant to despise that. Why would we? But recognize this, that that's not going to bring forth, that's not going to be even the sign of the apostolic. The sign of the apostolic is not that. It deals with this issue of the wise master builder, which is the spirit of the Lord unveiling his plan and how to get there. It's not enough just to know the plan. You know, we're talking right now about the vision and the plan. I understand the necessity. I know what's in your hearts, what's in my heart. How do we get there? That is the right question. That's why I just said what I did about Hannah. That is the first step in getting there. Divine order is in this, and it's everywhere in the scriptures once you see it. But it demands the Holy Spirit to cause us to see it. You, myself, all of us. Without the Holy Spirit, we're not going to get there. You know that, don't you? We need that fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want it desperately, and I want it daily, and I want it ongoing. And I want to be a partaker of him in this thing. I want that fire of God that refines me, gives me clarity of vision, singleness of vision. I mean singleness of vision in this way, to where God's vision and mine are one. I am completely submitted to him in this. I have no desire to build my own thing. Amen. You with me in that? I know you are. I'm, I'm, I, the challenge that's going out to us, and it is going out to us from the Holy Spirit, is to come out to him entirely in, in this hour and become that priesthood we were meant to be, become that people we were meant to be, fully his, fully given over. As congregations, to become the light in this valley that you're called to be. That means the fullness of his life and light shining through us. But there's this need to be builded together. Not separately, not independently. Builded together. Thus the Lord is going to release and is releasing the spirit of the wise master builder, that is the apostolic ministry. That is the true prophetic ministry. That's the meaning of Paul in Ephesians 2. The foundation layers were the apostles and prophets. They were the wise master builders. And the foundation is Christ. Paul makes that extraordinarily clear. He is the alpha and he is the goal, the omega. It is his fullness that's meant to fill us, and I took it onto eternal ground just a little bit last night, and through us fill the universes, plural. And the vastness of the creation that's filling that. And to move them off the ground of creator-created relationship. Such is the vessel that we're meant to be now and in the age of ages that is upon us. So the wise master builder, therefore, is going to have a demand for his workers, wouldn't you agree, to be aligned with him in his mind. Therefore, his mind must be made known to us. Isn't that true? That's why I'm going down this path of vision. That's why I'm belaboring this point. Listen, I want to say something to us. It's important that I think... I understand this, you understand this. All the dealings of the Holy Spirit with us are not random. If he's emancipating, if he's severing, if that fire is burning up, wood, hay, stubble, that's not random. God is after a vessel that represents him in this earth in exactness. And the work of the Holy Spirit is unto that very purpose. The invisible God becoming visible through us. That's just one part of the eternal plan. 
representation is what brought salvation to us. He became our representative. He took the blow due to us. Part of the great eternal plan is for God to raise up a vessel. Listen to this. Unlike any other vessel that's been created that would exactly represent him to the rest of the creation. The invisible God being exactly represented. His nature. The uniqueness of humanity is found in its ability to be a container for God to dwell in us. That is not true of any other creation. He's not their life. He's not living in them. You can only have exactness when you have kind. And that's the meaning of Genesis 1 and 2. The man did not have his kind. So God had to create her, bring her forth, the bride, the kind of God, God living in her. He is not going to marry that which is not his kind. It will not be invited to the wedding supper. Just read the scriptures. The people who came in there without, without the proper wedding garments were kicked out. Read Revelation chapter 19. Blessed are those who are invited. That means not everyone is. To the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's those who make themselves ready. See, the Holy Spirit's in us to make us ready. The five-fold ministry is given to make us ready. That means pressing, pushing us off the ground of salvific order, which is called the realm of the least in heaven. By the way, that is not our call. But most of humanity that's saved is in that realm. Been there and seen it. That is not our call, brothers and sisters. That's not why we were created. That's why I'm fighting for you. To get out. Out of this nonsense and this chaos called Western culture Christianity. In our hearts and in our minds. And come into fullness. Why we were created. Why we've been born again. Why? Why we exist. Why are we here? It's not just to be saved. Amen. Some things are worth fighting for and some things are worth dying for. I happen to consider that you are. I happen to consider that the purpose of God is. If by my life or by my death I can serve him in it, I'm willing. How about you? We were made for this hour. I was created. You were created to be here now. Don't miss your God-given invitation and opportunity to be associated with him in the eternal will and purpose of God that has no ending to it. Don't let these temporal distractions ruin our chance to make that decision now. This is the only place you can make it. There is no other place. You make it now or never. I'm talking about in this life. The seriousness of this hour for us. You'll have no other opportunity. And I've been, I'm sorry, I'm just going to tell you, I've been with too many men and women who have appeared before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm talking about believers. And saw the call of God way too late. The intent of God. And wept uncontrollably. I wept with them. But it's too late. They're saved. But they missed the purpose of God for why they existed. I don't want to get there and find that out. How about you? Amen. That this thing has been stolen from the church has had devastating effect upon the church. Ninety-something percent of what's being taught in the church is of salvific understanding. The high heavenly purpose has been altogether missed. I'm not saying that to condemn us. I'm saying what you know and I know has to happen here. We've got to come off that ground. We've got to come out to the Lord in this thing. 
Amen. That's my heart. That's what I talk about when I said, open last night. What is in, within my heart? This is what's within my heart. God would move a people onto that ground into an advanced spiritual position. That's my definition of it. To that place of the eternals and the eternal purpose and desire that we come into the very reason for which we were created. Why humanity was created. Humanity was created singularly to be a bride, not to be saved. Salvation is a necessity. It should be but a step so that we can make the right choice unto eternal purpose. You with me? You know, let me come right spirit to spirit with you. You know in your inward man that there's something more than just being saved. You know it. You're not here just to be saved. That can become so self-centered. You were made for more than that. A deeper relationship than salvific love. There's a higher, deeper love than that. It's called bridal love, and you've been invited into it. The great heart of God that none of the creation has ever even known about. It's being unveiled to them through our relationship with them. The angels are standing back. They're not just wanting to see into it for just curiosity. The angels aren't curious like that. They're wanting to see into it because they understand what we need to understand. That work of the Lord in us will be unto the rest of the creation, including the angelic order, to bring them off the ground. Listen to this. The angelic order off the ground of creator-created relationship and under the ground of family. But that great work is the work of God through the bride, and so they await the coming of the bride. So does the rest of the creation. We've been on the beach playing with the sand pebbles. God would push us into the deep. We were made for more than what we've become, brothers and sisters. I want it to end. I want this to be the final generation. I want the bride to make herself ready. That's what will trigger the coming of the Lord. Not the growing darkness, the readiness of the bride. When she makes herself ready, Revelation 19, he comes. In our way of seeing that, she gets ready. We pull up in the 56 Chevy. Out she comes, or 55, whichever one, 54. 53, get closer, <laughs> whatever it is, Bel Air. 55, okay, 55 it is. I like that one myself. Better than the 57. Didn't like the wings. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. <laughs> good, good conversation, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> Seriously, the readiness of the bride will bring the coming of the bridegroom. All right, so that's all out of one point. I can't tell you how many things I've written down, but so, so be it. But Acts 13, I want to just comment on this for a second. You know, the leaders of Jerusalem, they knew the prophets. They knew of the prophets, let's say it this way. I'm talking about the religious leaders now. They knew the books. Some of them, because of the priestly order, were able to quote entire books of the Old Testament. It had been a part of their tradition and requirements. The Apostle Paul, by the way, would have been able to quote certain books of the Old Testament in their entirety. But all of that can be true. And you can have that kind of memory. And you can understand that the prophets are there. But what can also be true is that you're never really hearing what the prophets are saying. You're hearing words, you're hearing phrases, you're identifying sentences. But what's behind that in intent and purpose is not being understood. Now I'm talking about the eternal now. 
that the temporal can so dominate our thinking, become such a filter and a grid to me, that the eternal, which demands revelation, of which the prophets are really uttering about, is completely missed. So, it's not a matter of our ability to quote scriptures or quote the prophecies or quote the books of the prophets. It's the meaning behind those words. You know this and I know this. If there was a language that could speak fully and completely about God, that language would be greater than God. There is no such language. And if you were to combine all known languages in the heavens and in the earth, they can never adequately present who he is. He is entirely too vast and majestic. We're dealing with something here of the created trying to represent the eternal. Now, I don't want to carry that to a point that we give up. Because I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt for that. I'm, it, preaching is entirely foolish to me. I've said it right to the Lord. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Talking about someone I hardly know. Anybody think that seems stupid? That seems stupid to me, but God gets a good laugh out of it, if nothing else. You know? <laughs> Sorry, but you're going to have to laugh about this somewhere down the line. Laugh or cry all the time. That he would allow us to hear his voice and utter it is an amazing thing to me. I wouldn't do it. If I was him, because he's going to be misrepresented. Anyway, forget I said all that. That's a downer. If you take that too far, he won't ever say anything. But I'm just trying to give us a perspective on this. Well, you can hear, you can read all of that, but here's my point. It is right now. I'm talking about now. What about now? What is behind the true prophetic ministry? What's really being said? Can it really be recognized just by casual reading? I tell you, it demands revelation. God wants to give us that revelation. He's not withholding it. But it begins by me recognizing the need for revelation that intelligence, natural intelligence, can't get me there. Brain power is not going to get us there. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This demands revelation. God is ready, willing, and able. He wants to reveal himself, and he wants to reveal his purpose. But you know and I know that is a challenge to us because of this. And then and, and there's another challenge to this because I've lived as long as I've lived, and you've lived as long as you lived, and I've had this experience, and I know this, and I've, I've seen this, and those things can become great hindrances to us because we think we know everything. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt for all of that. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I could still be as blind as a bat. As pertains to the need for revelation. I need God. Only God can reveal himself. He makes himself known. You understand as I understand that if that were not true of God, none of the creation would know the first speck about him. God's desire has never been that we know information about him, but that we have a relationship and experience him. That's not informational. He knew what information would do to us. He knew it would puff us up. He knew it would make us proud. Love builds up. He knew where this thing would go. Messages and teachings and sermonizing and all this nonsense. This saying a bunch of nonsense. And the heart of God's not in it. It's been missed. There's no brokenness. There's no emptying that's demanded. Listen, if we're going to be vessels for the Lord, he's going to take us to his starting point, and his starting point is brokenness, emptying, so that he might fill us. And there is no shortcuts. And if God has his way in 90-something percent of the church, it's not going to be a forward step first. It's going to be a backward step to brokenness, a backward step to emptying, 
A backward step to humility. A backward step. God, give us this. That's my cry to us as a people. God, give us a willingness to be broken, to humble ourselves, to be emptied so that we may be filled, so that we may become in this time the vessels of the Lord. It demands a step backward if we skip that step to begin with. We'll have to step backward to the emptying process, to the brokenness. Let me just say it plainly. To the devastation of the cross of Christ in our lives. That no flesh will glory in my sight. That's the cross. He'll bring it onto his ground, entirely spiritual. I mean of the Spirit of God, not spiritism which is creeping into the church, into the prophetic. Because we think, well, it's the human spirit. It is not. It is the Holy Spirit in the human spirit. We have to have divine order in this. Unless we want witchcraft. You do not open your spirit up to anything but the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's good preaching. I don't care what you think about it. I see spiritism in the prophetic all the time. People chasing the next new thing. That happens to be Jesus. <laughs> but we're not satisfied with him. That shows the state of affairs. He who has hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him is the unsearchable riches. And the church isn't satisfied. So the bridegroom has no bride because she's not captivated by him. And that's not because of who he is. It's because of our blindness. Amen. Let me tell you what I really think about it. Brothers and sisters, we have a problem here. Christ has become a stranger in his own house. We're preaching the things of God and forgetting the person. The Spirit of God is not okay with that. His entire ministry is to point us straight to the person. In the times past, the Godhead decided that the fullness that would fill the creation would be the Son. That was an executive divine decision. Through the Son, the universe would be filled. This is quoting Ephesians 4, what Paul writes there. The church has been duped and deceived. Doesn't understand who's the way of this, who's the truth of this, who's the life of this. This fullness I speak of is not the increase of things in us. It is the increase of a person. It is a relationship with that person. It is the fullness of his life in us that's going to be released in the coming age of ages. It's meant to be released now on this earth that we may be filled and be being filled. It has no end to it. We keep be being filled with who he is. The spirit of God taking that which is his, making it known to us. us it's done by eating. It's done by partaking. It's done by drinking. See, it's an experience. It's a relationship. I'm not talking about ecstatic experiences. I'm talking about the spirit of God gaining absolute dominion in us. Wrestling control out of our hands. I know that doesn't mean anything to any of you guys, but I tell you, I wrestle with controlling myself, especially in spiritual matters. The self-control that's mentioned by Paul as the fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit of God's nature activated in us. His self-control operating in us. Isn't that beautiful, brother? All of them are. His love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his long-suffering, his gentleness, his kindness, his meekness, his self-control. That's the fruit of the nature of God now being realized to us because Christ has come into us. But that's a journey. That's his first to seed. We must allow his increase and our decrease or we just remain immature. Amen. And I just preached, a, and that should have been about four sermons, but I just said it real quickly. But my point is this, so that who gets expressed is Christ. Yes. Not my idea of him. Christ himself. Paul hits in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I don't live any longer. Christ lives in me. Who's living? One is living in the many, and the many should be living as the one. There's real unity. 
It's life-based unity. There's one life in us. The Spirit of Christ. Anyway. It's getting later by the minute, of course, but... So, you can hear a certain degree of what the prophets are saying. You can read it. But is it really penetrating to the eternal understanding of what God had them speaking about? It is obvious to me that seldom was that the case among the people of God in either covenant. There is going to be a generation And there is going to be a remnant in that generation that are filled with all the fullness of him. That there has come to be a majority. I'm talking about of him in presence and in life in that people. I'm not talking about absolute perfection. I'm talking about a majority. Above 50%. At least 51. <laughs> right now, that's looking pretty good because we're at an all-time low. Sorry, shouldn't have said it, but I'm glad I did. <laughs> to where he is being represented. He's being expressed. He's being revealed. He's being made known through us. That when, listen, that when people come into this place, it's because they want the presence of God. What if, just want to put this out here, what if in the city of Phoenix, spread all over the city, the Lord was presencing himself among a people, and the word spread that you could go here and find God? Two things would happen. Most people would never come here. And the hungry would flood here. You know, there was a time in this nation where there were places, geographically speaking, you could go and find God. They're mostly gone now. Go to where Azusa Street was. The Lord's no longer presencing himself there. He was for a while. But somewhere down the line, the enemy got in. And the people of his presence were no more. Does that make anybody sad but me? That we can go to monuments of the past, but no present reality? That the enemy has effectively won a battle? by restraining the Creator from presencing Himself among a people. Are we, are we okay with that? I'm, I will never be okay with it. That's why I led us in what I led us in last night, to be a people of His presence. It's been true in various nations, various times throughout history, where you could go there in the Welsh Revival, And God was present. We're hungry for that, aren't we, Leonard? Again, again, in our time, in our time. That God so takes possession of us internally that externally he creates an environment of his presence. And people, this will happen, not only from Phoenix, but from across the globe would come to the presence of God. And that God would safeguard it so that it had no end. So it never became about the vessels of the Lord, but the treasure of Jesus. How about that? Why can't we have that? We are meant to have it. I believe in God's rights in this. He has a right to have a people. He has a right to have an inheritance. Amen. You with me in that? An eternal right. God the Father is going to see to it that the Son has a bride. That the Son has a people of his, that are His, His possession. They are his and he is theirs. And his banner over them will be love. 
He's going to have that people. He's going to have a people who will allow him to come and presence himself in an ever-growing measure, an increase of himself. I'm just saying this to instill vision and hunger into our hearts. I can tell the spirit of true spirit of prophecy is on me right now to say this to us, to, to proclaim it over us, that we would be that people that we would come out to him in that way. We would allow the presencing of the Almighty among us and all that that, belo- all that that means and all that belongs to him would be his among us. And we would give him freedom, complete, that's true freedom, for him to have his way, not us get our way. What about that? Is that not worth fighting for? Is that not worth praying for is what I mean? That's the fight that we need. On our knees, the altar of God reestablished until the fire of God comes upon us, burns and purifies, refines and cleanses, and thus God is able by establishing a priestly order, come with the weightiness of his presence. Without the Levites, the ark could not be carried. Remember that. Now, God's looking for that in our time, not a Levitical order that had to do with the things, but the dedication that was there, the set-apartness that was there. I'm telling you, he's seeking it. The Spirit of God is searching throughout the whole earth for a people who are his, a people who are ready, a people who will give him in exactness what he wants. That's the voice of the prophets. That's what they were crying out to the people. They had to hear beyond the rebukes that were coming. The rebukes were coming because of the present condition. We're in the same boat now. The prophetic ministry is meant to be a building ministry. But in situations like this, I'll tell you what it is. It's a confrontational ministry because what's been built does not represent him. It's not on holy ground. It's not in the heavens. It's not out from the heavens. Can you hear my heart and what I'm trying to say to you? You want to know what the intensity that's upon me? Because of the intensity of the Holy Spirit seeking a people. I don't apologize for how he comes on me in that. I can make mistakes, but I'm saying this to you. It is intense. It is this. It is the jealousy of God to possess his bride. And the bride is under a threat and he aims to fight for her. So do I. How about you? I'm here to see that he gets her. That's why I'm here. I appreciate the invitation, but I believe this about all of us. That's why some of you have come from distances, and some of you just come from the city. Because God deserves the bride, doesn't he? The bridegroom deserves her. The lamb deserves his bride. That burns within my heart. He must have her. He must possess her. I have no hidden agenda in this thing. It's not a ministry thing with me. I'd rather be home on my face before him. I'm an introvert, I love to be alone. But something's got a hold of me and it's a corporate thing. May get a hold of you. I can't run and hide, Leonard. I can't check out of this fight. I'm in the fight, I want us. I'm calling to you, I'm pleading to you, I'm begging with you, get involved in the fight. The lamb is worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. May the burden of the Lord be upon us in this. May we truly hear the voice of the prophets in this time as God brings it forth. May we hear beyond the words of it, beyond the language itself. May we hear the heart of God that's in this thing. That's my cry. What about God having a people who are completely his? What about that? What about a people who will be, as the Lord said, the terror of the whole earth? That's called the bride. She is this royal priestly vessel who's a warrior. Never forget that. What if we, in this hour, as is the intention of God, I might add, fully gave ourselves I want to ask you a question. When you read the scriptures and you read what God did in the past, do you believe that what he wants now is any different? 
The same God who did what he did in the past among Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Isaiah, what's called the minor prophets. Not minor because their message is not important, just the books were not as lengthy. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is after anything different than what he was then? I tell you, he's after the same thing, a people, to be God's possession. For God to be able to presence himself in this earth, and Satan has resisted that from the beginning. That's why it's a strategic proclamation when we welcome him. It is an in-your-face to the enemy. We will be a people of the presence. It's a warfare issue. It's a bring it down, bring the fight on. Make no mistake about this. That call will bring it on to you. Be clear with you in this. It's not unintentional. It is intentional, and I'm being intentional by doing it. I aim to bring the fight to your doorstep. Fight! You're already under it anyway. The decision you have to make is participate in the fight or just take the blows. You're already targeted. Our question is, are you going to fight back? Are we going to lay over and take it? And watch our families disintegrate into darkness. Watch our homes, watch our children, watch the children be consumed by the darkness. I am not okay with that and I will never be. In this rising darkness, I believe in God arising in us in light. In power, in life, and authority, and fullness. How about you? And then for that, for that we are sent. For that we go. For that we speak. For that reason, for his name's sake, not our own. Never our own. For his name's sake, thus we declare. There's just something too large in this, isn't it, Leonard? I, wanna, I want the Holy Spirit to hit us with that. How large this thing is. The eternal meaningness of this. That, listen, your life is meant to make a difference now. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Throw, uh, throw off those lies. You are not unimportant. As a vessel of the Lord, it will be all the difference through you if you'll let it be. Let him be everything he can be through you. Everything. You with me in that? I'm saddened by the present state of affairs. I mean this, the spiritual smallness, the spiritual weakness, the spiritual wimpiness. It's not meant to be that way. We are to be those possessed of the Lord, those filled with the Spirit, aren't we? We're to be the strength of God in us, the life of God in us, the authority of God in us, the power of God. We're to be a holy nation feared by the other nations if they don't want the Lord, but welcomed if they want the Lord. Amen. Make no bones about this. There is this eternal distinction between God and everything else in his creation, especially this darkness. The quickest way to pick a fight is allow light to come, to allow life to come, to allow his beauty to come forth. What I'm telling you is this, so expect it. Don't expect when we get the life of God and everything's going to be okay. You get the life of God and you will find hell directly confronting you. But take it as an encouragement because Satan is militarily minded. And it is a threat-based assessment. That which is the greatest threat, he assigns the greatest forces to resist. So take heart. That's meant to encourage you because I know what's going to come on you. These proclamations are going to bring it down. So we're going to make one more before we end here. And i got to end. So I want to say this to us. This pushing, this pressing that is going on by the Holy Spirit. Can you feel it? Holy Spirit is pressing us. Pushing. In a good way. I love it. <laughs> I do. I'm not one for status quo. I wasn't made like that. I aim to be pushed by the Holy Spirit into fullness. I want his fullness. 
I will never be satisfied with anything less than fullness. The more you eat, the more you want to eat of him. The more you taste, the more goodness you discover that he is. The more you're filled, the more fullness you want. That's how it works. Isn't that true? The more you drink, the more thirsty you are. The more you eat of, the more hungry you are. I love that about him. It's a push to fullness. And I ask the Holy Spirit to push us hard. Spiritually speaking, internally. Push me off the ground of status quo. Push me into a pea patch where I stand alone and will retreat no further. That this ground is worth fighting for. You know, I'm speaking of one of David's mighty men. David had it going on. He knew what it took to see the, listen, to see the temple built. David understood that it couldn't be built until the land was cleared of those tribes that were antagonistic against God that should have been driven out in the days of Joshua and or in the days of the judges. And David, with that kind of wisdom, understood if the house of God had been revealed, God was going to build a house. And David instinctively, by the Spirit, knew this. These tribes cannot remain in this land or the house of God will never be built. So he launches a military campaign to rid that land of those tribes. I'm saying this to you. These tribes cannot remain in this land or the house of God will never be built. So he launches a military campaign to rid that land of those tribes. I'm saying this to you. God is launching a military campaign to rid us, his land, of these antagonistic tribes that have been allowed to dwell in us for far too long. Feel the intensity of that for just a second? This Amalekite spirit that's had its way in us way too long. You know, the backbiting, attacking from the rear spirit, Amalekite spirit. The Holy Spirit is launching a military campaign against these things within us in order to build us to be the house of God. I say yes and amen to him in it. So here's my last declaration. Maybe stand and maybe get the shofar blower back up here for a second. One more declaration. Are you okay with that? Are you clear that it's going to bring it down onto your heads? <laughs> you ready for a fight? <laughs> We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to take intercession seriously. Understand how God uses it. Understand the need for Hannah. Understand the need for Rachel. It's a simple declaration. calls us to be warriors, Lord, ready for the day of battle. Can you say that back to the Lord? Calls us to be warriors, Lord, ready for the day of battle. Just lift your sword right up to the Lord. Just look on his face for a second. I am with you in this, Lord, unto the end. There is no retreat. There is no hiding. There is no compromise. And there is no mixture. Bring forth your inheritance. Possess your possession. Take hold of us.
Just brandish the sword for just a second. Why would we do that? Because it's an intimidation factor. For too long, we've been intimidated by the enemy. Just brandish the sword for just a second. This, this time where the enemy has had his way with us is at an end. Where darkness can hide among us, it's at an end. Where, there, where witches and Satanists can infiltrate our ranks in order to cause trouble, sow sickness, break up families, break up marriages, ruin our children's lives, put their hands on us and impart demonic things to us, is at an end. There are consequences. You know what I mean? Put their hands on our children like they like to do. I'm not okay with that. I'm not blind to it either. Brandish that sword for just a second. You want to fight? You got it. If you're looking for trouble, trouble has found you. Brothers and sisters, I call you to awaken to the fight that's going on around your family. You know the truth of what I'm telling you. Going on for your own mind and your own heart and your own children's hearts and minds. Going on for your brothers and sisters and their homes. Going on across this city and across this nation and the nations. So brandish the sword. It is an act of defiance to the enemy and submission to the Lord. We call for the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the Sabbath. You've not come to take sides, you've come to take over. We submit to you in it. I call you to fight the good fight, that's on your knees. To dedicate ourselves again to the presence of the Lord to the prayers of the Almighty, His very desires eternally, to begin to call them out to Him in our own private lives and corporately, to allow Him to bring us in full alignment with His will and purpose. Establish, Lord, warriors in your house again, warriors. Establish it, Lord. There's enough in this room to affect Phoenix. I tell you the truth of this. God never wins by many. He wins by few. It's the story of Gideon. There's enough in this room to do something here in Phoenix that God's been longing to do. So have your way among us, Lord. We will not be bullied. We will not be pushed around. In the spirit I'm talking about. We will fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the promises. Arise, O God, arise. Scatter your enemies. Bring forth a harvest of souls in Phoenix. We cry out to you for the lost. We cry out to you for souls, Lord. We cry out to you for your church as you would have her on your ground and heavenly ground. So be it, Lord. How many want to just make a declaration? Uh, Put your hands down for a second. Just a somber moment here. Before the Lord himself, I will give myself to you in the secret place. I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand before the Lord as a dedication. I will give myself to the secret place. 
I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will be a trigger point for the congregation of God to call us, to call us corporately to rebuild the altar. Impart, Holy Spirit, fervency of spirit, key to the warriors. Fervency of spirit. Just want to release that to you here in the presence of the Lord. Fervency of spirit, not fear. Fervency of fear, spirit. Thank you, Lord. Align us, Lord, with the spirit of the wise master builder, the spirit of the Lord. That we be workers laboring together with you, aligned completely with your mind and your heart, your will. Thus, you can and will be effective through us as vessels.